going on in uh, St. Paul, by the way. Uh, you know, I have uh, some pretty strong opinions about uh, what's going on down there. Anyway, any questions? Yeah. Do you see our country headed for an economic collapse? And if so, what? The, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, Adam Smith, <coughs> uh, when uh, one of Adam Smith's students came to him, I don't know if all of you know this, but The Wealth of Nations was published in 1776. Uh, so, you know, you had the American Revolution and the publishing of The Wealth of Nations. Uh, it was a good year. Uh, Adam Smith, one of his students, certainly could. I mean, there. Uh, if it happens, it's going to be the debasement of the dollar. They're going to. Inf they're already trying to inflate away the debt. Uh, I mean, they don't intend to pay the debt. What they intend to do is make the dollar worth less and less. I mean, uh, and uh, where's the blame on the AAA rating going to double A rating? Isn't that evidence in itself the way we're going? Yes, I mean, the reason why the rating dropped was, was not that Standard & Poor's thought that we couldn't pay. Uh, and technically, we can pay because they can print legal tender. I mean, we never default on the, we'll default on the debt in that way. Uh, it was a judgment that the United States of America could no longer be fully relied upon to have a stable economy. Uh, you know, it's not the pieces of paper that matter, or the dot, you know, the the ones and zeros of computers matter. Uh, I mean, I think you know, if the pieces of paper are only like a hundred billion dollars actually out there. I mean, it's all in computers, but uh, uh, it's all all the worth of our money is based upon the soundness of our economy, and uh, you know, the simple fact is is that we've moved. I mean, we think of Jimmy Carter uh, as having done a terrible job. Uh, uh, but in terms of the, the damaging policies, uh, Barack Obama is a thousand times worse. I mean, Carter actually started deregulating things. I mean, things have gotten so bad uh, that, uh, you know, the deregulation of trucking happened under Carter. The deregulation of the airlines happened under Carter. Uh, uh, you know, Carter was not a great economic manager, but at least he had some grounding in reality. By 1978-79, it's kind of like, well, this ain't working. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, you know, not to defend the guy, because I really hate Jimmy Carter, actually. Yeah. He's been <laughs> terrible. Uh, Is that why they developed the misery index? Yes. Uh, but a lot of that, actually, uh, you know, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, he was partly paying the price for what Johnson and Nixon had done. I mean, they uh, delinked the dollar from gold. Uh, they increased federal spending dramatically. Uh, Nixon had wage and price controls. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Carter was bad, but he was continuing down a path that actually uh, two presidents before him had. Uh, started going down. I mean, probably the, you know, the two single worst things uh, that were done to the American economy over the last 50 years were wage and price controls under Nixon and the linking, uh, you know, from gold. And uh, uh, Paul Volcker, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve that Carter put in, uh, was able to squeeze inflation out of the economy. Yeah. So, uh, seeing all this and, and having a little insight into what's going on, where, well, where do you put your money? If you're looking four or five years down the road, I'm the worst investor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the funny thing well, is, diversify. Uh, yeah, diversify. It may, it, it may also be. I mean, you know, the weird thing is, is that. Uh, 
inflation often, ironically enough, means stock markets go up. Because at least with a lot of companies out there, their inherent value, uh, you know, government can do bad things and have bad policies, uh, but a lot of companies will still remain profitable and they'll just go up in nominal dollars. Uh, so, you know, what worries me about something like gold is, uh, uh, you know, which I did not invest in 10 years it should have, uh, is if you if you remember the last big run-up in gold that happened under Carter, uh, uh, and really during the decade of the 70s, it went from like 35 or 50 bucks an ounce up to over a thousand, and then dropped to 200. I mean, uh, people think of gold as an inflation hedge, which it isn't. It's a crisis hedge. People put their money into gold when they don't know where else to put it and then they take it out of gold and put it into more productive things when things get, uh, get sorted out. So, I mean, it's quite possible that, uh, say you, you know, bring in a reasonably responsible uh, uh, president with a reasonably responsible Congress, it may be that gold deflates. I don't know. I mean, I could see gold going to 5,000 bucks an ounce, too. What happens when the dollar, if things remain the same on the same track, and three, four years down the road, the dollar just goes bust? And then what happens? Barter. What's that? Barter. Maybe, although the funny thing is I was talking over with a friend of mine who, who makes me look like I'm a flaming liberal. And I, I, I made a joke about, you know, liquor and, and bullets. And he said, no, actually, if you look at countries that have gone through this, like Argentina, uh, uh, it doesn't really happen. Uh, uh, that, that, I mean, there's certainly some of that, but it takes a total societal collapse to get to that, that point. My wife's family comes from Venezuela. And what they did was, uh, they were just two generations away from, from Spain. And so, by Spain's rules, they were they could apply for Spanish citizenship, which they did, and then they put their money into pounds. You know, because you know there are export controls there, but they were able to get around them because they were all dual citizens. Uh, I could see if Europe actually faces its problems. Uh, I could actually see going from. You know, the Europeans are now putting their money into the United States. They go in exactly the opposite direction. You know, if they actually have their sort of financial calamity, which they've been putting off, at some point, I mean, it doesn't go down to zero. Uh, and countries that really face their problems actually bounce back relatively quickly. Uh, I could see Europe being the best place to put your money. Uh, now, I'm not predicting that, but uh, uh, because, I mean, Europe is a great example of how politicians, uh, how many times did you, have you heard that Europe has finally faced, you know, we finally faced the music? Lost count. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the first time, you know, and I was reading the, I, you know, I love reading economics news, the first time I just scratched my head and said, like, these guys must know something that I don't, because it doesn't look like they face the music. And then it was like, well, no, they just kicked the can down the road. And then they kicked the can down the road again. And they keep on waiting for the fairy with the magic dust to somehow solve the problem. And, or, uh, almost as good, eventually the next election comes and it's someone else's problem. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the problem is that that sort of worked for a long period of time. I mean, you really look, I mean, we had a very nice run from World War II uh, to, you know, the 2000s, or at least the 1970s. Kind of a bad run in the 1970s, but things got better. You know, conservatives won, uh, and kind of put things back on an even keel. Uh, but that nice run is over. I mean, you know, the, the problem for, I mean, again, we're better off than Europe because the problem in Europe is there are no people left. Most people don't understand that. 
I mean, you know, they build up all this debt, but the average age of those countries is just, I mean, they're old compared to the United States. And so you're looking at people who, you know, 30, 50 years of people retiring with no one to work. So how are they going to pay off the debt? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know whether this is strictly true, but uh, in uh, Italy, the demographics are such that you'll have, you know, eight great grandparents. Is that right? Uh, and then you'll have the grandparents, and it all comes down to there'll be one kid taking care of everyone on the street. You know, if you look, it used to be the eight great grandparents would have 80, 100 descendants. Now they have one. And I don't know how it's going to work out, but even China, I mean, remember all the, you know, how all the left wingers are like, the one child policy, it's the greatest thing on earth. They've got so many people. Well, you know, China, uh, over the next 50 years, I think demographically, they're going to have a race between getting people from uh, the countryside, which is still a fairly large labor pool that's unexploited, uh, uh, and the aging of the population. They're going to have a real hard time keeping this going just because they're going to run out of a labor pool or something. They're coming for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't... It's going to be very interesting to see. China is is rapidly becoming a superpower, uh, but the demographic basis of their economy uh, is falling apart, and they're going to have a race uh, between those two things. Yeah. David, could you hit on the term that uh, legislators have said about passing legislation called pay as you go, where if they make a law or a bill, that it has to be funded and it cannot be um, passed without that funding? Is that something that we should promote more as citizens to keep our politicians accountable as to <coughs> pay as you go? Theoretically. Uh, uh, Look how well it worked at the federal level. Yeah, the problem, the, the problem is, is that... Well, we start at the local level and yeah. we do with what we can and then like you're saying, that's what American exceptionalism is all about. We start local and work yeah. our way up. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that in general, uh, uh, I'm a little more cynical about local government than I ought to be because uh, the way, at least in Minnesota, so many local units of government either are or claim to be dependent upon aid, local government aid, uh, uh, that if you know, if they raise taxes, they point at the, the state and say, they didn't give us enough money, and blah, 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 blah. You know, and a lot of that, most of the time, that's BS. Not all the time. Uh, but, for instance, most suburban communities, which have raised their taxes, uh, uh, don't get any local government aid. So they look at, a, you know, the, the state cut local government aid, which is true. The state cut local government aid. You didn't get any. <laughs> you still raise your taxes. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think it's a, a good idea. At the end of the day, we've got to hold them accountable because any statute they pass or rule they pass, they can undo. Uh, and they regularly do it. Just like, uh, you know, the doc fix. You know, well, here's how we're going to get our spending in line. Well, we'll make an exception. We'll make another exception. Uh, and, you know, now at the federal level, there is no budget. Literally, they have not passed a budget in two years. The Senate hasn't, right? Yeah, yeah but that means there's no budget. Right. The federal government is is running on autopilot. 